Well, good morning and welcome to Elevenses. Uh, it's a Wednesday morning here in London. It's a bit of a gloomy day today at the moment. It was bright and sunny early on, but uh, it's clouded over. It looks like the run of um, bright, sunny days we've had has come to an end. Um, we may get some rain, which will be good for the garden, if not for biking. Um, so anyway, onwards with today's show. What have we got for you? Uh, Highways England denies that there's stopped vehicle radar units are too far apart on smart motorways, uh, even though new sites will have them close together. A climate change committee supports personalised road pricing. Husqvarna's unveiling the e and concept bike. MAG calling on the police and crime commissioner candidates to tackle bike theft. A Pakistani woman who was rushed to hospital on a motorcycle uh, and uh, in a photo that went viral has returned home. And uh, so a slightly less good news story about motorcycles. A Kenyan UNESCO heritage site is being swamped by motorcycle taxis. So settle yourself down for the next 20 or so minutes uh, while we bring you up to date with some uh, topical news. Uh, Cheryl's looked in and drive safe, drive to drive safe. That's Duncan in New Zealand, of course, isn't it? Yes, it's, he's just announced it's Duncan. Hello, good evening to you, Duncan, over there. Um, right, okay, so the smart motorways stories, they, well, they just keep coming. Um, you know, every time I kind of open the news feed, there seems to be another update uh, to the effect that smart motorways are a problem. And this one is to the effect that an £18 million order for stopped vehicle detection radar units, which would be retrofitted to stretches of smart motorway, which were built without them, um, has just been upped by £7.7 million. And the reason for this is that the order was originally based on the spacing used on the trial stretch of road and it turns out that those units which were put at 500 meter distance from each other are actually too far away from one another to actually cover the distance between them effectively so highways england which is a government-owned company uh, issued their original contract to navtech and they were described by transport secretary grant shapps as the only supplier available to provide this uh, technology but they have now added a, a modification notice to this order, which admits that uh, it says, although the original scope and estimated value for the supply of these uh, stop vehicle detection radar under the framework was determined based on the understanding that the radar units would be sighted on average 500 meters apart, it seems that a review of their effectiveness has um, decided that they need to be 300 meters apart in all future installations. So the, the original um, spacing wasn't optimum. So basically, as a result of this decision, additional radar units and their associated commissioning and support services have become necessary under this framework. And the estimated value, as I said, is seven and three quarter million pounds on top of the original order. Now, this reciting appears to follow a disclosure that during a 2016 trial of the system, Incidents where stopped vehicles came to a halt outside the range of the radar was actually recorded as a successful detection, even though the radar completely failed to detect the stopped vehicle. Um, and this trial uh, happened over a 13 kilometer stretch of motorway. It used 27 radar units, hence the 500 meter spacing. Uh, and it was thought that each unit would be able to work uh, up to 250 meters in each direction. So therefore giving you that full 500 meter coverage. But apparently um, that didn't work. Yet, despite this, um, David Bray, who's Highways England Smart Motorways Project Director, has said that uh, it's entirely inaccurate to claim that stop vehicle detection radar are sighted too far apart to be effective. The current technology is effective as currently used. Um, it's also inaccurate to suggest that retrofitting of smart motorways could be delayed. And he says the decision to place radar closer together is simply because it's more efficient to attach the units to existing infrastructure rather than putting up new 
structures to hold them. Well, um, 7.75 million to build new pylons or 7.75 million to attach new radar to existing gantries. Um, obviously, there's something going on there a bit behind the scenes that we're not getting the full story on, I suspect. Uh, the retrofitting program is due to be finished by the end of September next year, um, and Highways England are uh, confident they can meet the deadline even with the new units going in. Uh, what's not so clear is whether Highways England intend to do anything about smote, the smart motorways, which are already equipped with the stop vehicle detection radar, but at the longer spacing. Um, Highways England are also apparently looking for a, another supplier to uh, supply these units as well, presumably to sort of try to drive costs down. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, the latest on smart motorways. Uh, Alan Goran has looked in. Uh, morning, Alan, from the Devon Advanced Motorcyclist Group. Hi, good to see you there. Right, so what else has been going on? Well, um, ever since electric vehicles uh, appeared on the market, promising uh, that uh, charging them with electricity would basically cost less to fill up the tank, I've said that the long term that pricing model is simply unsustainable simply because the treasury derives a big chunk of income from duty and vat on fuel um, in 2019-2020 the fuel duty alone amounted to over 27 billion pounds now that figure was slightly down on 2018 uh, 2019 and as the trickle of cars powered by electricity further increases, uh, revenue will drop further. Um, so how is the government going to make up the shortfall? Uh, well, Baroness Brown of Cambridge, who's chair of the Climate Change Committee and their Adaptation Committee, um, has suggested that the answer is what she called highly personalised road user charging. And she suggested that this, uh, what could be used as a model for this is how insurance costs are charged to motorists. Um, and she was responding to questions basically after a presentation to the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation on how the UK can deliver the target of zero net emissions uh, by 2050. Um, she argues that the uh, attitudes of the public uh, have changed around personalised charging and that she thinks that road charging would be a fair way to handle motoring taxation after phasing out of diesel and petrol engines. And she went on to say that uh, road user charging was something they were keen on back in the King Review, which uh, dates from 2007. We were very keen, she says, to propose replacing taxes associated with driving with a time, distance, place, emissions and occupancy charge. Um, whatever you like now, because we can so easily monitor these things. It could be an enormously fair way to treat people. It seems to me that you can have a system that takes emissions into account and that would be fairer to everyone. We're now seeing insurance companies looking at having this system for charging based on how you drive and where and when you drive. So this kind of monitoring is coming. At, a time, at the time of the King Review, people were shocked by the idea of intrusion into privacy. But I think we've moved an awful long way to thinking some of these ideas is, might be acceptable. Well, I'll certainly be interested to hear other people's views uh, on this, but personally, um, whether it would be a fair and equitable system, I think is always open to debate. Um, whenever personalised pricing is put in place, it seems to me that the result is always a rise in costs to the consumer generally, because uh, the argument always is, of course, that your particular case is a more expensive one. Uh, do that across the board and everybody pays more. Um, Baroness Brown actually also pointed out the need to begin creating the public charging infrastructure with urgency. And she said at the moment we have about 25,000 public charging points. Some people estimate we'll need 150,000 within the next four years. By 2035 we will need around 400,000 public charging points. Well, I suspect that's actually a huge underestimate. There were over 30 million cars on the road last year, not counting light vans and motorcycles, and most of those would be needing overnight charging if they're to be used for commuting. And in many areas, there's simply no way to do this on private property. Where I live in northwest London, as I've mentioned before, I have no off 
road parking and stringing a 240 volt cable across the pavement is a non-starter um, and that's not even counting the possible uh, you know requirement to recharge mid-journey um, so um, you know how they're going to deal with it in a street like mine where there are several hundred houses uh, virtually all cars are parked on the road I have no idea you know effectively that's at least one charging point per house um, so anyway there's one that's open to question so any if you've got any ideas on that to uh, do drop me a line with them I'm interested to hear um, Alan's just responded there I'll just pop that one up actually as you can see so there's a work in the construction industry and we don't think we can run vans fleets on battery my L200 trucks company owned a pocket at home would mean the employer needs to provide the electricity to recharge the car how how will this be possible that's a very good question and uh, you know there are a lot of puzzles here that we uh, we really don't have answers to at the moment um, one possible solution to that would be smart meters uh, whereby the costs of charging the vehicle uh, would be it would be detected that you're plugging an electric vehicle in um, presumably it's perfectly possible to identify that uh, electric vehicle too um, so that you could then uh, uh, charge at one particular account for your home vehicle and one for a work vehicle but um yes uh, interesting question there okay uh alan also says where do we get all the electricity from well um there, that's another question altogether which i'm not going to go into today as it's a motorcycling show but uh yeah ask, ask me that one later uh and clive has also looked in and said good morning hello clive um and uh, yeah, there's actually another comment here, which I'll also pop up from Duncan in New Zealand. He says, funny how the discussion never counts the cost of mining the lithium and the disposal of such uh, in New Zealand. The population is so low, losing fuel tax would cost the individual heaps. Uh, we also pay heaps for the motorcycle. Yeah. Um, Yes, okay, so there are a bunch of problems there. Uh, one possible solution to the lithium problem is a new generation of batteries which uses the much more readily available, much less toxic sodium. Um, so there are possible solutions. Um, and while we're talking about uh, electric cars, why not let's talk about an electric motorcycle? Um, I meant to get that up a moment ago. Uh, where are we go. Um, if you know your onions, you'll probably recognize that as a Husqvarna. Um, it's the e pillen it's a concept bike um and uh, husqvarna are the latest manufacturer to unveil their e-concept motorcycle um, and it's scheduled for launch actually as early as next year um the, so the design and the specifications would likely be fairly close to the final product as um, we're already heading towards the middle of this year um the e pillen concept there as you can see uh, clearly builds on uh, what's described as a minimalist minimalistic and progressive design of the vit pillen and svart pillen uh, bikes uh, or to put it another way with its sawn off rear end it's uh, ugly in my opinion um, but there we go that's my opinion uh, the bike itself will be meant for the urban commute not for intercity trips it's an eight kilowatt 10 horsepower electric motor and it gets an estimated uh, 62 miles or 100 kilometers from a tank full of electricity. Uh, the CEO of Pira Industries, who are the uh, owners of Husqvarna, Stefan Pira, said that customers expect huge mileages on electric bikes, uh, which is an interesting observation because it's usually the range that uh, turns people off the idea. And he says that offering high energy density batteries, uh, which would give you a decent range, is expensive and means losing profitability. Now, Husqvarna are part of a group which has signed up to develop a common battery pack for motorcycles and light electric vehicles. And the other signatories are Piaggio, Honda and Yamaha Motor. Um, and so the, uh, the inference is that the battery pack on the bike will be hot swappable, basically. You'll be able to whip it out and put put a new one in obviously you'll have to pull up somewhere where you can get a battery to do that but if the infrastructure is in place and there are enough battery swap um, locations um, it is at least 
doable in theory. Um, in any case, 100 kilometers range, uh, 60 odd miles, uh, should be enough for a couple of trips to work before it needs recharging. Um, the other possibility is that the bike uh, will be fitted with a sort of a battery as a service subscription model. Now, I know that happens with some cars. You basically buy the car and then you rent the battery. And the idea is that if there's a, a change in battery technology or your battery starts to fail, you can swap that battery out and get a new one for it. Um, anything else to talk about about the bike? Well, it should get the usual uh, instrument console, giving you power modes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, smartphone connectivity is a given these days to allow you to interface with it. Um, but where is it going to be made? Well, the answer to that is India. It will be built by Bajaj Auto in India as one of a range of e-bikes of different power output. And uh, if you're interested, there is a teaser video from uh, Husqvarna which I'm just about to put up in the chat line there. Um, okay, Alan says he'll give up when he's forced to use an electric bike. Um, I don't get too uh, anti, Alan. I will say go and try one. Um, you know, the, the Zeros are actually damn good fun to ride. Uh, they might make a weird noise, but they do make an interesting noise. It's a bit like a jet engine spooling up as you accelerate. Um, so yes, it's not a petrol engine, but, uh, you know, they are motorcycles. They do do what motorcycles do. So go and try one. Um, what else to say? Um, well, Bill news from the uh, training directory. It's been a fairly busy week for me, uh, actually, this week. Um, I've had, um, what have I been up to? Well, I've got a presentation this evening, which I'm delivering to an audience from Thames Valley Advanced Motorcyclists, and I'm reliably informed we have 100 uh, bums on seats for that already, and that is the, the limit, basically, for the, the chat. So that'll be good to put that one over to TVAM later. Um, I ran an on-road session at the weekend and got two more planned for tomorrow and Friday, so I'm just hoping the weather holds up, actually, because uh, there is rain around. Uh, tomorrow's route will be out over my Essex uh, roads and uh, if you've not done those particular roads they are very good fun to ride they're also quite dangerous they're some of Britain's most dangerous biking roads and uh, when you ride them with me you'll see why um, Friday is a slightly different kind of uh, ride out we're not doing a training session so much as a riding assessment or sanity check for the uh, the guy concerned so we're doing a bit of everything we'll start off on my hearts routes uh, up near St Albans but we'll do something I don't normally do which is some motorway and uh, fast dual carriageway work we'll do a bit of town centre as well and we'll come back in via some of my rather nice twisty Buckinghamshire roads um, before ending up somewhere near where we started um, so I've also been running uh, the briefings and debriefings which are now online for those courses and I had a bit of a different one this morning as well I did a uh, online coaching session for somebody who um, had a, a crash that he was having a little bit of trouble getting to grips with and understanding why it happened um, you know when we fall off and uh, you know even I fall off sometimes um, not recently, but uh, in the past, I certainly crashed a fair bit. But what I have tried to do always is not have the same crash twice. I like to learn from the the previous one. Um, so the idea of these sessions and to, uh, is to give people a chance to you know come to me in in face to face really. And uh, what we were able to do this morning um, was do what I've done online for years. Um, you know for. for back on the old CompuServe forum back in the 1990s on Visor down through the uh, 2000s uh, in the old forums. I've done it via email. But using Zoom really does add an extra element to trying to diagnose a problem for someone and offer some suggestions. Um, it's far more interactive for starters. I mean, basically, the person at the other end can ask a question and get an instant answer uh, you know via a forum or email uh, yes you can ask me a question but it has to wait for me to read it answer it and then the there's a delay while the reply comes back and so on and so forth um, the connection on zoom of course is uh, instantaneous and it's multimedia too now yes i could draw a diagram or send a photo and append it to a forum post or an email but having the ability to draw 
uh, on a whiteboard in on real time on the PC and actually explain what it is I'm talking about as I draw the, the diagram makes things a lot easier. And of course, I can also tap into my collection of photos, video clips and what have you to try to help with a particular explanation. Anyway, suffice to say, we didn't entirely solve this morning's issue, but we did cover enough to uh, give the guy um, a, 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 a a reasonable idea of what might well have happened. And we certainly were able to suggest some strategies uh, to prevent a recurrence of the crash. So um, at the end of the hour, uh, my chat partner was uh, happy enough that with his time that we'd spent looking on his issues. Um, so if you do have any kind of riding issue that you want talked about, uh, do drop me a line and I will do my best to look into it. And of course, if you're up for an in on the road course, I've got plenty of dates available um, uh, through May and into June. I'm opening a dates up in June because the weather's yeah, just starting to look a bit iffy for next week. Um, so there we go. Uh, that's uh, what I've been doing uh, with my time this week. Um, okay, so don't forget you are watching uh, Kevin Williams here of Survival Skills Rider Training and catching up with the Elevens' uh, webcast. Um, you can catch it live every Wednesday and Sunday at 11. And if you missed it live, you can either see it here on Facebook, of course, or you can head over to YouTube and see it over there as well. So set yourself a reminder for that. Um, here in the UK, the Motorcycle Action Group is calling on uh, candidates for police and crime commissioner roles in Hertfordshire and West Mercia to make a pledge to tackle motorcycle theft. Now, MAG have been collating national theft data by police force area, and what they have found is that in two particular regions, um, bike theft has shot up dramatically. Uh, London, of course, is the uh, theft capital of the UK, but Hertfordshire, um, for some reason, has shown an increase in 50% in bike theft, uh, which may or may not be connected with its proximity to London. And West Mercia has also shown a big increase, uh, up 42%. So, um, MAG's Director of Campaigns and Political Engagement, Colin Brown, has said, uh, we still have a few responses to come back, but Hertfordshire and West Mercia's responses are sticking out like a sore thumb. Out of 34 responses so far, only three have shown an increase. When the national trend is significantly down, that's uh, on bike theft, of course, is what he's talking about, we have to ask why Hertfordshire and West Mercia have such ominous increases. So what MAG have done is written directly to all seven candidates for Hertfordshire and West Mercia for the uh, election of the PCC. Um, the request is that each candidate pledges to review motorcycle theft in their area and work with MAG to tackle the issue. Colin says, naturally, we'd hope that all the PCCs will commit to working with us on tackling theft. Uh, the figures for West Mercia and Hertfordshire are of particular concern. London remains the worst area by far, but we cannot ignore such worrying figures coming from these two areas. And uh, MAG will uh, publish any responses that they receive from these candidates no later than Monday, the 3rd of May, so that if you are voting in any of these elections, you can see where candidates stand on the matter and you can make your own vote count. Um, now, I did have a photograph for this story, but I seem to have lost it. I've filed it in the wrong folder, I think. Um, the story that went viral on social media last week um, has had a happy ending. You might have seen this one. Um, uh, somebody called Zhao Hassan was snapped taking his ailing mother, Rahina Begum, to the hospital on his motorbike in Pakistan. Um, but uh, the unique bit was that he had a 20 kilogram oxygen cylinder strapped to his back. Um, she had taken a COVID test, and although she hadn't got the results, uh, she was rapidly declining uh, as his, uh, his her saturation, oxygen saturation levels in the blood rapidly decreased. Um, so a medical officer at the local health complex told him to admit her to hospital urgently. But he couldn't get hold of an ambulance or even a three-wheeler taxi to take him to 
the hospital during the lockdown. Um, so what he did was sat her on the back of his motorcycle and uh, carried the oxygen cylinder with him and delivered her personally to the hospital. Um, so both Zell and uh, his mother tested positive for COVID-19, um, but both are now at home in a stable condition. Uh, she was kept in hospital for six days uh, for treatment, but has now been released and they are now self-quarantining at home. So that's a positive story about motorcycles. But unfortunately, not all motorcycle stories are so positive. And uh, here's a slightly odd one um, from the old town of, of Lamu. It's a historic uh, Swahili island trading outpost in a remote corner of Kenya. Um, so remote, I've certainly never heard of it. Um, but it turns out it's a UNESCO listed heritage site um, because of its historic nature. Um, unfortunately, what has happened is that in re the recent uh, months it's become swamped with motorcycles. Now a decade ago there were only two vehicles on the island. Uh, there was a motorcycle for the electric company and the district commissioner had a four by four on the island. And they were the only two vehicles on the islands but in the recent two years there's apparently been an explosion in the number of Boda Boda motorcycle taxis. Um, the count at the moment is somewhere around 400. Now in February steps were taken taken to ban these boda bodas from the waterfront and from 16 hectares of ground uh, which is ringing the the old town which is the UNESCO heritage site and uh, basically uh, until fairly recently goods and people uh, in Lamu were transported either by boat or, or by donkeys or donkey cart and the local Save Lamu Community Association is actually striving to return to those means of transport to preserve the cultural heritage of the town because it's an important attraction for tourists. Um, and that's one of the reasons that the town was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2001. It's the oldest and best preserved Swahili settlement in East Africa. It also was a hugely important trading centre, um, bringing many cultures together, including Bantu, Arab, Persian, Indian and European. Uh, it's been continuously inhabited for 700 years and it's been a trading outpost for all these cultures for much of that time. So it really has got a very, very important historical context. But the economy is fragile. Um, tourism to the area has been disrupted by occasional terrorist attacks uh, uh, there. And of course, the border closures due to pandemic uh, response uh, for COVID has also had a significant impact over the last uh, 15 months or so. And the fishing industry has also suffered as well, not just through overfishing, which uh, tends to affect uh, fishing industries pretty much globally, but also um, thanks to some dredging work which has been going on nearby, um, a huge port is being constructed uh, just to the north of this ancient island and basically the dredging has uh, stirred up a lot of mud and uh, disturbed the fish stocks. So this has affected the island's youth uh, pretty badly and um, not surprisingly, some of those have turned to driving these Boda Boda taxis uh, to make some money. Um, if nothing is done, the World Heritage Committee is likely to add Lamu to its list, list of heritage sites in danger at its next meeting in July. Um, so, yeah, we have complex, complex socioeconomic problems right across the world. OK, uh, so um, that's it for today, really. Um, if you are thinking about some training, do drop me a line. If you want some coaching online, also drop me a line. Um, don't forget, um, if you want to catch these videos uh, and get a notification of them, um, apparently you need to go and click the little bell icon, which I can't see myself because uh, I'm looking at a completely different screen. But um, there should be a little bell icon, which will be filled in if you are correctly subscribed. And the trick is, apparently, if you're watching on a PC screen, is to go full screen. That's the only way you'll see the little subscribe bell. Um, don't forget, uh, we offer all sorts of low cost and even free 
biking resources uh, you can head over to my uh, coffee page and uh, there are now um, over 400 articles up I'm currently putting the 2018 articles up from the survival skills back catalog on Facebook and there is of course the YouTube uh, channel as well survival skills uh, UK um, don't forget that all important UK on the end and the 60 second safety series of videos I'll be putting a fresh one of those up tomorrow um, that's it for today um, so thank you for tuning in uh, stay safe out there hopefully see you back at the next show on Sunday thanks for watching bye for now